Grocery store number one was the most exclusive shopping experience the city had to offer, open only to the elite. The walls were an ornate, adorned with gold leaf. The pillars were marble, the tops decorative and intricate, flourishes that befitted a palace. It was a regal setting for the tins of food polished and stacked with labels facing forward, the fresh fruit arranged in patterns, spirals of apples, hills of fat potatoes. Several days have been spent preparing the store. Each aisle overflowed with stock. The storerooms have been pillaged, and everything had been brought forward and meticulously displayed. The result was a venue that Leo immediately recognized as an entirely inappropriate choice for their guest, a fundamental misunderstanding of the audience it was intended for. This store didn't represent a model for new society. It embodied the past, a czarist era snapshot of exuberant wealth. Yet the gaggle of party officials beamed at Austin as if expecting him to applaud. They had let vanity get in the way of identifying what their guest truly wanted, presenting him with ostentation, abiding by the calculation that the more they showed him, the more impressed he'd be. Their profound fear of being seen as poor and shabby in relation to their American foes had blinded them. Leo paused behind tins of pea soup stacked in a pyramid formation. He'd never seen food arranged this way and wondered why a person would be impressed by such a display. Austin passed the pyramid, looking at it with the same, surrounded by clump of officials keenly pointing towards exotic fruits that Leo couldn't name. In an attempt to uh, uh, integrate the success, its excess with ideology of communism, the shoppers, all MGB agents have been selected from across the age spectrum, dressed in plain clothes and scuffed shoes, as though grocery store number one were for everyone, the elderly grandmother and the young working woman. The staff, meanwhile, men for the meat counter, women for the fruit aisle, have been instructed to smile at Aust as Austin passed them by, their faces following him as if he were the sun and they were flowers turning into his light. There were more shoppers outside, off stage, shivering in the snow, entering at apparently random intervals in order to maintain the impression of people coming and going. Austin's expression grew increasingly sour. He was no longer speaking, his hands were deep in his pockets, his shoulders slumped, while all around him customers behaved like a flock of magpies, swooping from aisle to aisle, picking up anything that caught the light. Leo glanced in one shopping basket to see three red apples, a single beetroot, and a tin of processed ham, an unlikely set of requirements for any shopping excursion. Austin broke free from the clump of officials, once again approaching Leo. He'd evidently decided that Leo represented the ordinary man. Perhaps it was his coarse uniform and gruff reticence. During the car ride here, Leo had said almost nothing, in contrast to the incessant pitter-patter flattery of the officials. Austin placed a hand on Leo's shoulder. I feel I can talk with you, Comrade Demidov. Of course, Mr. Austin. Everyone wants to show me the best, but I just want to see the ordinary stores where ordinary folks shop. Is there somewhere more ordinary around here? You can't seriously be telling me every store is like this one. Is that what you guys are telling me? Leo felt the pressure of his question like a hand tight around his heart. He answered, no, not all of the same. We're in the center of town. This store might have a better range than a village store. I'm not talking about a village store. I'm talking about an everyday store, you know? This can't be the only place in town. There are other shops, yes. Within walking distance? Before Leo could answer, the officials hurried over, keen to divert their guests back to the displays. They still had things to show him, fresh bread, the finest cuts of ham. Austin raised his hand as if to keep him at bay. His mind was made up. My friend is gonna take me on a walk. He's gonna take me to a smaller store. You know, one that's a little more ordinary. The officials glared at Leo as if the suggestion had been his. Their survival instincts were acute. Suddenly, the two other team of agents pushed forward, addressing Leo. That is out of the question. We must stick to our itinerary for security reasons. Austin raised an eyebrow and shook his head. Security? Are you serious? I'm not in any danger here, am I? They were trapped. They could hardly claim they couldn't protect him on the streets of their capital. Austin smiled. I know you've got rules and regulations. I know you've got things you want to show me. 
but I want to be able to explore, okay? I insist. Do you hear that? I'm insisting. He laughed to soften the order, but it was an order nonetheless. They were under instructions to do as their guests requested. From the way the others were looking at Leo, it was clear that he was going to be blamed. Leo led the group out of the store, appointed head of this expedition to surf in the search of the ordinary. Austin was by his side, his mood already improving as they trampled through the thick snow. Leo glanced back to see officials in animated conference by the store's ground doors as a new influx of carefully down-dressed, scraggy shoppers in cheap coats arrived to find the show was over. The party officials didn't understand what Austin wanted to see, but they knew it wasn't long lines and poorly stocked stores. Since they were under strict orders to accommodate the singer's every whim, they could hardly intervene. So that's the first extract. And you have to read the book to find out uh, how disastrously wrong uh, it goes. Um, uh, and let's give you a very short, I mean, the book is, is structured in two halves in a sense. You have half in, in uh, New York and uh, Moscow, and you have half in Kabul. And uh, Leo in Kabul is, uh, is an older man. He's also someone who is flirting with despair for the first time. And it's interesting to take an, an idealistic character and, and bring them to the point of despair. Um, so this part is in 1980 in Afghanistan. This is the, the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. With his back to Kabul, Leo stepped into the lake, fully clothed, plunging up to his knees and continuing to walk. His khaki trousers bleeding, satin rings of red dust onto the water's surface. In front of him, the snow-capped teeth of the mountain range bit into the pale blue sky. The spring sun was bright, but not yet strong enough to temper the freezing river waters flushed with mountain snowmelt. He knew the lake should feel cold as he raked his fingers through the emerald green surface. Yet as the water level rose and flows uh, flowed over the hip of his trousers, he felt wonderfully warm. Were he to trust his body, he would have sworn that these were tropical waters, as pleasant as the sun on his cracked, tanned skin. He didn't raise his arms, allowing them to sink into the lake, dragging behind him as he walked. Soon the water was up to his shoulders. He was on the cusp of the shallows, his feet arriving at the ledge where the lake's depth dropped sharply. Another step and he'd sink beneath the surface, the heavy stones in his pocket weighing him down easing him to the bottom where he'd come to a rest, seated on the silt belt. At the borderline he waited, the water lapping at the top lip, close to his nose, the surface trembling with each slow breath. The opium was thick in his blood, insulating his senses from reality. Until it thinned, the drug would cocoon him against the cold, and everything else, the disappointment of his life he was living, and the regrets of the life he'd left behind. Right now, in this moment, he was devoid of troubles, connected to the world by nothing more than a thread. He felt no emotion, just contentment, not in the form of happiness, but contentment as the absence of pain, the absence of dissatisfaction, an exquisite emptiness of feeling. Opium had made him hollow, scooping out the bitterness and reproach. That he'd vowed revenge, promising justice, and achieved nothing did not upset him. His failures had been banished by the drug, a temporary exile held at bay, ready to return when the opium effects wore off. The water lapping at his, lip, at his lips urged him to continue one step further.